Michael. Okay, can we please stand? If you're visiting here today. Oh, I didn't pray for the kids. Well, stand up anyway. They're all ready to roll. Father, we thank you for our young people, Lord. We bless them. Father, we thank you that they're part of the church now, not the future. Father, we thank you that you want to speak through them and you want to use them to impact this world. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is doing through our young people. We thank you for our teachers and their willingness to serve you as they bless our kids, Lord. But, Father, most of all, I thank you for you. I thank you that you're waiting to receive these guys. And, Father, they are going to come away changed because they spent time in the presence of the King. Bless them now as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Who's teaching today? Emma. Emma? Follow Emma right there. All righty. If you're here visiting, on the back, on the screen behind me, um, there's a scripture that we always pray, but we're not speaking about a building. We certainly believe that Christ, that God visits buildings, Holy Spirit visits buildings, but he decided to dwell in the heart of man, right? So when you pray this prayer with us, think of yourself, ready? How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have decided to use us to bring the power of heaven to earth. And that's awesome, Lord. Help us. Father, again, we have an identity crisis. We don't know really. We don't know who we are, Lord. Please teach us. Teach us to know who we are. Teach us to know about this power that is at work within us, Lord, and how you want to use it to, to literally bring heaven and earth together again. What an honor, Lord. It's an honor. Help us, Father. And Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here. Please, Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. Nobody needs to hear from me. Have your way. I pray that my words would be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. Did we say hello to our girl, Jennifer? Say hello to Jennifer Bliss right there visiting. You know who she is, right? She's from, She's now she's from... Bosnia from through Kansas now here, but she'll be back in Bosnia one of these days. So, all right. So we've been talking about Jesus. <laughs> you know that guy, don't you? And uh, look, I got a text from Mike, and there he is, right there. We've been, I've, been, I've been trying to, like for me, and I'm, I'm convicted. This, I've been convicting the heck out of myself lately. You know what I mean? Well, the Lord is convicting me, you know what I mean? And it, and it has come out to you guys. Um, but, you know, Jesus, uh, man, he was a rock star, huh, Lord? He was a rock star, man. He was so good at what he did. And he was so good at no matter what the situation was, no matter what somebody was 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 going through no matter what they were doing no how much how much sin they had or whatever the case may be he had this uncanny ability to make them feel loved ne never to make them feel condemned ever and so i want to talk a little bit about this this morning the title i put on uh, my sermon is hey look at the log in your own eye first <clears throat> let me say this loud and clear if I'm talking to anybody here, I'm talking to myself. Because what we're going to talk about, I learned some hard lessons in this area because I failed miserably at it <clears throat> in the past. Amen? Amen. Amen? So in John 8, we read about a woman caught in the act of adultery. Not only was she caught in the act of adultery, that she was thrown at the feet of Jesus by men who wanted to kill her. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about this woman. But if we think about it, and you know, we use our heads, put yourself in the, in the story, right? We can figure out some stuff about her. So I want to do that, right? So we know she was married. How do we know that? Well, Jewish law called for a single woman who slept with a married man 
to be strangled to death. So that means that person got hung. But a woman who was married and committed adultery, she was to be put to death by stoning her. What the heck? Uh, you've come a long way, babies. Thank God. So we know this woman's married, right? Because they're going to stone her, the Bible tells us. They're going to stone her to death. So she's married, which means at some point she had been a young bride filled with dreams of having a husband, a husband that would love her, and a husband that would raise a family with her. Whatever her hopes and dreams were, they didn't include what was happening to her on this day. You can believe that. Where things went wrong is hard to say, but we could probably guess, right? She probably was disappointed in her marriage. It might have been her husband's fault. It might have been hers fault, but probably it was both of them's fault, right? Maybe she felt lonely. Maybe she felt unappreciated. Maybe she didn't feel valued. Maybe she was taken for granted. Maybe all the above. Somewhere along the line, she met another man who noticed her, though, right? Who listened to her, who paid attention to her. It was what her heart longed for. Started out innocent, but then line after line was crossed, and before you knew it, she ended up in bed with this guy. She started living with this secret in that culture. Remember, with the culture that she's in, right? I bet it was killing her. Living a lie, the constant weight she carried of being caught, the guilt and shame because everything she had been taught by the religious leaders led her to believe that now God hated her. That's what women were taught back then. Then it happened that day. They literally kicked in her door and caught her. The man was just as guilty as her, but they didn't do anything to him, did they? They just let him be. Her, on the other hand, she was grabbed and pulled out naked and screaming, marched across town for all to see, humiliation increasing with every step. She probably realized they were taking her to the temple, but why? Why would they be taking her to the temple? Are they going to kill me in the temple? They stop outside the temple, humiliated and embarrassed. She hears this. Open your Bible to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. I'm going to look at verse 4 and 5. So now you're in the you're in the scene? Are you in the scene? He's in the scene. This poor woman, okay. Her and this guy make a mistake, but golly. They kick down her door, they drag her out. Can you imagine her grasping for the sheets, grasping, trying to get clothes on, trying to do something? Uh -uh Uh-uh-uh, they just drag her out. Humiliate her in front of everybody. But not only do they just drag her out, they drag her across town. They drag her across town. The guy, on the other hand, nothing. He just... Goes home, whatever. I don't know what he's doing. The Bible doesn't tell us. So they, get, they bring her to the temple because that's where Jesus is at. He's teaching, right? Now remember, so they brought this woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group. The group, does, remember what we, talked, we said about Jesus? Wherever he was, there was always a crowd. So not only do they bring her before Jesus, they bring her before a crowd of people, right? This is what she hears. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? Imagine. Put yourself, ladies, put yourself in that position. She has no doubt that their intention is to kill her at this point, right? Imagine her panicked eye frantically surveying the scene. 
Imagine how she feels. And she sees the one who is being asked this question that would determine her fate. Because they're asking Jesus, what should we do with this lady? What do you think? What do you think we should do? And as always, there was a crowd, like I said, gathered around him. Then this man knelt down and started to write in the dirt with his finger. He's a rock star, man. I love, I love Jesus, man. Seeming to ignore them, he wouldn't answer their question. He wouldn't answer their question. She probably tried to read what he wrote in the dirt, right? All the while, these religious leaders wouldn't loosen their grip on her, demanding that he condemn her. So can I ask you an awkward question? Can I? Who are you tempted to condemn? Who are you tempted to write off? Who are you tempted to blame for your hurt? Who are you tempted to shame for their sin? If there was someone you caught, if there was someone that you could grab and bring to God and accuse, who would it be? Think about it. Who is the person you wouldn't mind throwing stones at? See, like the religious leaders, maybe you find yourself dealing with some self-righteous anger because of something someone else has done. But oftentimes, guys, the self-righteous anger that these religious leaders had came not from something done to them, but something that they did. See, when we feel guilty about our own sins and struggles, the guilt often comes to the surface in anger. And anger has a way of spilling out on the people around us, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And then those people become angry, and their anger spills out on people, and then those people become angry, and it just keeps perpetuating and going around and around and around and around. On and on it goes. Recently, I I read some research on the growing numbers of road rage in our country. Church, we have become angry people. We are angry in this country. One of the reasons for this increase is what psychologists call the anger bandwagon effect. You see, anger is often contagious. One angry person can make the people all around them angry, right? We've experienced this. We've probably caused it sometimes. Anger, like love, has a way of spreading. We see it. One angry negative person affects everyone in the room. Am I the only one who experienced this? You get what I'm saying, right? Even on the Internet, which is absolutely mind-boggling to me, right? One angry person starts ranting on social media. What happens? All these other people get riled up, and they have to join in with the negative nonsense, the stupid posts, the name call, whatever, whatever. Guys, when we hold on to anger and bitterness towards a person, it has a way of leaking out and infecting all of our relationships. The term for this is transference. Our resentment towards a parent can cause us to have misplaced anger towards our own spouse. Transference. Anger we feel towards a coworker has a way of following us home and transferring over to our kids. Right? Your anger towards the people that you have hurt or who have hurt you builds a wall around your heart. And that doesn't just keep those people at a safe distance, though. This is the problem. It keeps everyone at a safe distance. That's what anger does. Ask me how I know. Uh, talk to my wife. <laughs> I know a little bit about this. I can talk about this because I have been set free from a lot of this. I'm not saying I'm perfect. But boy, right, Joe, if they knew me a while ago. 
Some of you knew me when I first came here. I was a stinking hot mess. Hallelujah. So who makes you angry and why? That's a question you have to ask yourself. Well, the reason we're inclined to condemn them is because they have something about, there's something about them that we don't like, right? That's why we condemn them, people. Or could it be there is something about them that subconsciously reminds us of something that we don't really like about ourselves? Could that be the problem? In their anger, these self-righteous religious leaders have become experts in judging, rejecting, and condemning people. But let me ask you a question. Has condemning a person ever changed that person? <laughs> have you ever met someone who told you, man, well, I was this certain way. How about, we deal with a lot of people in recovery. Man, I was struggling so bad with my addiction. But then I met this hate-filled person who made me feel condemned, and my whole life changed. <laughs> I don't know. Man, I got sober that day. I don't know, man. Did you ever meet anybody like that? Because I certainly haven't. I never met that. I never met that person. Another question. Has feeling condemned ever helped you? Let's bring it home. Has it? Have you ever felt better when somebody condemns you? Have you ever been encouraged to change, have encouraged to do something? I doubt it. You know why? Because that's not how condemnation works. Condemnation never works that way, ever. It's designed by hell to put you down and stomp on your neck. That's, what it's, that's where it comes from. Romans 2, 4 says it's kindness that leads to repentance. You want me to sing it? It's your kindness, Lord, that leads me to repentance. <laughs> I knew I could count on Allie. <laughs> See, angrily pointing out a person's sins doesn't lead them out of sin, church. I, I tell you, I really, I've really grown... To, to recognize this in myself in the last year. Because, you know, I deal with a lot of people in recovery, and sometimes it just frustrates the mess out of me. You know, it just frustrates, man, because you, your heart is you want to see these people change. You want to see people set free. And you work with them, and you work with them, and you work with them. And so many times, man, I'm, I hate that I have to admit this even. I just run out of patience. I just ran out of patience. And, and, and my, my, my heart was to help them, and something happened where I know they felt condemned. I just got tired of the excuses. I got tired of the stuff. We can't confuse our bitterness and hatred with showing tough love, church. Because that's, that's how we dress it up, man. Well, they need tough love. No, they don't. No, we don't need it. Loathing doesn't lead to life change. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about how we are to treat others and warned us of the seriousness of anger. He also did something wild. He put people who have anger, anger in their hearts in the same circle as murderers. What the heck? Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subjected to subject. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. See, put, people look at that and they say, man, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a murderer. But again, let me read it, verse 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Jesus' point is this. We can't feel good about ourselves for not being a murderer 
if we have anger in our hearts towards someone else. See, that's what we do. Well, at least I'm not a murderer. Yeah, but you're still an angry sucker. Doesn't give you a free pass. Does it? Am I talking to anybody here this morning? Is this on? Hello? Hello? <laughs> Guys, I'm not a murderer, but there have been many times where I've become angry and expressed it in hurtful ways, raising my voice, calling names, being disrespectful, gossiping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Our tendency is to dismiss it as no big deal. Everyone gets a little carried away now and then, right? And after all, I'm only human. How many times we use that lame excuse? Well, after all, I'm just human. I'm not done yet. God's not done with me yet. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Thank God. See, some of you get angry, but you don't yell, right? You hide your anger. See, I'm going to talk to everybody in the building here this morning. Trust me. See, you're not the type that lets your anger to be seen. In fact, I'll be real honest, you guys usually judge people like me because it's easy. I'm, I'm passionate, man. It's hard for me to keep my big, fat mouth shut, right? But let me tell you what you do. You guys withdraw. You go silent. Not as a way to collect yourselves, but a way to hurt the other person. Let's be honest. Can we be honest this morning? You know full well your ongoing silence and passive-aggressive spirits are driven by anger. You know it a minute. The religious leaders were angry. They were full of self-righteous hatred as they dragged this poor woman before Jesus who was teaching, hallelujah, but then he starts writing on the ground. This is a great story. Now, as the story unfolds, we see, we see the way Jesus handles people and we see how angry people handle people, right? There's the contrast in this story. We don't know why or what Jesus was writing on the ground. There's many, many, many theories. There's many, many opinions. But nobody knows what he was writing on the ground. All we know is to do that our man was writing on the ground. That's all we know. The one thing we do know, though, is this. By writing on the ground, Jesus took those condemning eyes off of this poor woman. That's how I see it. Now they're all wondering what he's writing. What's he doing? What's he doing? What the heck is he doing? Why would Jesus want to do that? Why would he want to take their eyes off her? You know why? Because she was his daughter. That's why. She was God's daughter. Man, church, we got to get this, man. The people that we yell at, and these are God's sons and daughters. She was ashamed. She was embarrassed. Quite frankly, she was devastated. But Jesus was and is full of compassion. Hallelujah. The accusers waited for the condemnation that they were hoping for. Then Jesus finally looks up and he says this. Back to John chapter 8. Somebody should just love Jesus this morning, man. When they kept on questioning him, while he's drawn in the sand, he straightened up. I believe he straightened up, looked him dead in the eye. Let any one of you as without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. She must have thought, that's it, I'm dead. Imagine, because he's talking to these religious leaders, right? See, these guys were known for being sinless. And if there was any doubt about that, all you had to do was ask them, and they would tell you that they were sinless, right? She probably closed her eyes. She probably held her breath, and she waited for the first rock to hit her in the head. 
I'm done. But instead, rocks started hitting the ground one by one by one by one. It's a great story. The religious leaders all dropped their stones, all of them. The hands that held a firm grip on her arms, whatever, that were holding her down, they released their grip. The men all walked away. We're not sure why. Some speculate that when Jesus wrote on the ground, he wrote all their sins. Maybe. He might have done that. Perhaps they all knew that Jesus knew them. That's what I think. I think they knew this guy could see right through my facade. Hallelujah. Maybe. Because the fact is we don't really know. What we do know is that this poor, humiliated lady must have been so confused on what's going on, what's happening to her at this point. That we know. She didn't know what to do. She just stood there. This is how I see the story. Embarrassed, humiliated, devastated. She just stood there naked and absolutely ashamed. You see, apparently only someone with out sin has the right to judge someone else with his or her sin. I'm talking to these this morning now. I'm talking to us, church. Let me say that again. Apparently only someone without sin could judge someone else with his or her sin. And because all her accusers were sinners, all of them, there was no one who could judge or punish her for her sin. You see how Jesus is? You see, there was one guy there that wasn't there, though. There was one guy there. The guy that wrote in the dirt standing right in front of her, he could absolutely judge her, couldn't he? He could condemn her. But look what he says. John 8, chapter 10. John 8, uh, verse 10. Now he straightens up and he asks the woman, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Has no one condemned you? She was just caught in the act, standing naked in front of a man who apparently had some kind of authority over even the religious leaders, and he's now speaking to her. In verse 11, the first half, she says, no, sir, no one. She still wasn't sure what was happening, but she saw something in his eyes, didn't she? Come on, put yourself there. His eyes were full of compassion, and then he speaks to her again. She says, no, sir. And she says, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Incredible. It's an incredible story like so many that we see in the gospel. With Jesus, every story of destruction has a chance to end in celebration. With Jesus, something broken can become beautiful. Hallelujah. As one person at a time discovers grace and learns about forgiveness, when they deserve judgment and expect punishment, Jesus shows up. Hallelujah. The religious, the religious leaders of Jesus' day who were condemning this woman, you know, they kept a list of what sins were acceptable and what were unacceptable. This is how hypocritical these guys were. They put people into two different circles, people whose sins were considered no big deal and those who were considered a really big deal. The really big deal people were judged, shamed, and condemned, like this woman. The religious leaders seemed to use two criteria to, to determine what circle someone was placed in. You ready? I think the first one is, is it something people can see? See, they were obsessed with appearance in these days, right? 
He dresses them, remember? You whitewash wall. You clean the outside of the cup, and the cup the inside is filthy. You brew the vipers, cause them. Right? So they're obsessed with appearance, but not so concerned with authenticity. Hello. I just said something there, boy. I hope you heard that. See, they're more obsessed with appearance, but they don't really care about authenticity. As long as I look good. I just keep the act going. So they would tolerate and look the other way when it came to sins of the heart. Are we that different? I can tell you this. Rarely has anyone confessed to me and my wife things like greed or jealousy or discontentment or things like that. We don't get many people rolling. And got, hey, Frank, can I talk to you for a minute? Uh, we don't get much of that. If no one can see it or find out about it, then what do we think? We think, well, then it's not that big a deal, is it? The second thing is it's something I don't struggle with. For them, and if we're being honest, can we be honest today, church? Can we? There's a tendency to be hypercritical and judgmental of people whose struggles are different from my own. Let's think back a few years. Some people still here, some, a lot of them left. When the attic crowd started coming around, some people lost their mind about you guys. They were threatened. They didn't understand. And they would be, oh, they should just stop. Oh, just shut up. You should stop. It wasn't what I struggled with. So it was easy to point my finger at you, drunken idiot, stupid. Just stop. Just say no. That woman, she was brilliant. Right? And if you remember, slowly but surely, I tried to turn this big ship. And I tried to point out that the only difference between somebody like me and somebody like you is our coping skills. That's the only difference. So I got drunk and high to deal with this, and you have a $30,000 credit card debt that, to deal with this. Really? Are we that much different? Are we? The woman's condemners thought her sin defined her. Listen, church. The woman's condemners thought her sin defined her, that she was her worst mistake. They believed that by holding her up before Jesus in the crowd, everyone would see that her sin diluted her value, that it made her disposable and unwanted, unwantable, that's the word I made up. <laughs> <laughs> Filled with compassion, Jesus let the woman standing in front of him know that she was not defined by her sin. Church, please hear me. She was not defined by her sin, and neither is anybody in this room defined by their sin. She wasn't the worst thing that she ever did. Her worth was based on God's love for her. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You see, guys, listen. If we are defined by our sin, it would make sin the ultimate authority. If we're going to define somebody by what they do, by their sin, then that sin, you're saying, is their ultimate authority. Hallelujah. But God is the ultimate authority, church. God is the ultimate authority, and we and this woman are defined by his love. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad that my stupid mistakes didn't define who I was. It was God who determined who I was. It was God that met me in that dump. It was God that said, no, Frank, I know your life might look this way, but I'm telling you, I got a plan and a purpose for you. Trust me, Frank. Trust me. Give your life to me. Let me show you a whole different perspective. Hallelujah. Many, many, many people, and I know I'm talking to a lot of you here, said there's no way that cat makes it. 
There's no way he's going to die. He's going to kill somebody and he's going to be killed. He's lost. And God said, I don't think so. I don't think so. Filled with compassion, Jesus let that woman standing right in front of her that your sin doesn't define you. No way. You see, guys, if we're defined by our sin, then that's the ultimate authority. But I know we don't believe that, do we? God is the ultimate authority. So God defines who everybody in this room is. Thank you, Jesus. All of that because a reality for this woman, all of that became a reality for this woman because Jesus showed her compassion instead of condemnation when he had every right to condemn her. Jesus changed everything. And when he did, I think this woman's worst day became the best day of her life. Let me look, let's look at again what Jesus said in John chapter 13. I'll get us out of here soon. Verse 34. A new commandment I give you. A new commandment. Remember we talked about this? Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. One of the primary ways Jesus loves us is by forgiving us when we don't deserve it. And that's how we're to love others. That's what we're told. We're told this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. Just as Christ forgave you. Let's take it a little further, though. He's with me? Are you getting it? Do you remember what, I, what our homework was when we left here last week? What was it? We were supposed to leave and make God look good. This is how we make them look good. 1 John chapter 2, verse 4 to 11, I'm going to read. You ready? Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar. That's some harsh words right there. What did we just read? Jesus tells us to do what? Love people the way I love you. Forgive people the way I've forgiven you. Don't hold them grudges. Don't condemn people. Don't think you're better than anybody. Take the log out of your own before you notice the speck in someone else's. I don't care if it's your, if it's your ex-wife. I don't care if it's your boss. I don't care if it's your ex-girlfriend. I don't care who it is. We don't get a pass. None of us get a pass. None. Right? Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his, his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister, still in the darkness. I ain't right. Frank, this isn't the book of Frank. It's not. This is the book of, this is God's word, right? Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness, they do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Man, that's some hard words. That's hard words, but that's God's words. Can I encourage us all to go back and read 1 John 2, 4 and 11 again? Can I encourage you to dwell on that? Meditate on that? Think about what God's saying? As someone who has blown that many, many times in his life, I encourage you to let that sink in. 
if we know Jesus and we, and we want to know that we're in him, then we have to live in love as he did, church. That's it. And that means offering forgiveness and grace even to them people who hurt us. Even to them people, man, that we're just mad at. In 1 Corinthians 13, 5, it says that we are to keep no records of wrongs done to us. So, that, so not only am I supposed to forgive the person, but I got to... St- I got to stop bringing it up over and over. I got to keep reminding myself what this person has done over and over. And everybody else that I come and come, do you know what so-and-so did? Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? Do you know? See, if we know Jesus and we want to know that we're in him, we have to live like he did. When faced with a sinner, a blasphemer, a betrayer, an accuser, or a denier, Jesus demonstrated compassion and grace. (laughs) So we got to ask ourselves something. You ready? Is that how I love? Is that how I love? My assumption is that most Christians today are not known for Compassion and grace. I hate to say that about us, but that's a fact. The world doesn't look at the church as people full of compassion and grace. They look at us as judgmental, condemning bunch of know-it-alls. That's me, and that's you. That's the way it is. And it's really, really wrong. It's really wrong. Something doesn't add up, man. I think part of the confusion is that we consider ourselves to love the way, to love this way I'm talking about in general. We look at it in general, but we're often not acting it out specifically. See, we all want to say, yeah, I love people, yeah, I love my love, but then that person gets in front of me and, uh, <laughs> well, that's different. Do you know what they did to me? talking to anybody here this morning? See, what I mean is that we agree with grace and compassion theoretically, but we have a hard time putting it into practice. And I think there are a couple reasons for that, but I just want to look at one, one reason. Can I do that? It's because we don't recognize our own sin. That's why. We want to point out everybody else's sin, what they did as if it's a big deal and mine's just a little deal. Let me be honest. We have trouble thinking of ourselves as sinners, don't we? We have a problem thinking that we're no better than anybody else. We know we're not perfect. We know that. We say it all the time. But other people's sins, oh, that's a lot worse. I would never do what that person did to me. I would never have treated him like he treated me. What's that statement says? That statement says I'm better than him. I'm better than him and he's a lousy sucker. We rationalize or just don't recognize our sin, which in turn makes us feel superior to others. That spirit of feeling better than can lead us to be condemning instead of compassionate. And see, that's the exact opposite of Christ. So we want to say we're Christ followers, but we act the exact opposite of him. So if I say I'm a Christ follower, but I'm acting the exact opposite of him, who am I following? Who am I following? Ain't him. It ain't him. Think about this. God says if you're guilty of sin, you can't judge sin of anyone else. That's what we just went through. If you have any kind of sin in your life, you have no right to judge anybody else's sin. No matter how 
bad you think it is. See, only Jesus was sinless. He was the only guy that ever walked this earth that was sin, sinless. So only Jesus has the right to judge. He's the only one. When those men dragged that woman in front of him to stone her, what did he say? He said, man, if you have no sin, then go ahead and kill her. Give her what she deserves. We got to go back to the, to the teaching from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. See, after Jesus put angry people in the same circle as murderers, he put people who lust in the same circle as those who've committed adultery. Come on now. You want me to read it to you? I'll read it to you. I'll read it to me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Red letters. You have heard that it was said you should not commit adultery. Yeah, stinking adulteress. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus is speaking to those who believe that they're better than the people who committed adultery. Now, you might think adultery is someone else's sin, but I'm telling you guys, adultery is your sin and it's my sin. I wonder if Jesus wrote only one word in the dirt that day. Maybe he just wrote lust. Hello. Hello. These religious leaders didn't have the love and compassion Jesus did for her because they didn't see their sin was just as offensive to God as this poor woman they drug out and humiliated in the streets. Jesus helped the religious leaders realize they were in no position to judge this woman. So they dropped their rocks and they walked away. Jesus, on the other hand, had every right to condemn her, to judge her, but he didn't. He said it. Is there nobody here to condemn you? Well, neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. The only one who had the right. Neither do I condemn you. But hey, you got to leave that sin life of yours alone. He used this position of sinlessness not to condemn, but to offer grace. The guy that was better than everybody who stood there didn't act like he was better than anybody, did he? He didn't act like he was better than that man. He certainly was. Instead, he offers compassion. He offers grace. Help me, Lord. Speaking the truth to her about no longer living in sin, because he did, did not require him to condemn her. This is what we got to learn, church. Calling her on her sin didn't mean he had to condemn her. You see, we can still be compassionate and call somebody out on their sin. But we got to use the mind of Christ. If we get in our flesh, and if we think we're any better than anybody, mm. let me ask you something. We all know the most famous verse in the Bible. You know what that is? It's the most famous one. You should. John 3, 16. What is it? God so loved the world. Yeah, how many is no 17, though? No. Ain't she so proud of herself over there? <laughs> Let me read it to you. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't come to condemn anybody in this room. I can't speak for you guys, but I can speak for me. I should have been. I know what I did. I know. And I know what Jesus did for me. See, because if it wasn't for him, there's no way I'm here. 
Because even if everybody forgave me, I couldn't forgive me. You didn't have to condemn me. I was real good at doing it myself. And Jesus gave me that revelation. That Frank, I don't condemn you. Why are you condemning yourself? We need to recognize our sin, church, and we need to realize that we're in no place to judge anybody. And please, if you ever reach a place of sinlessness, if you ever get there, and you can use that position like Jesus did to offer some grace and kindness. How about that? Hallelujah. So God is calling us, church. Listen to me now. If you haven't heard anything this morning, here it is. God is calling us, this church, Crossroads Christian Fellowship, to offer grace and unconditional love regardless of how we feel. The challenge is not just to accept that call theoretically. That's not the challenge, church. The challenge is to actually offer it to the people that we come in contact with. To offer it to the people that we have issues with. To offer it to the people that we've been justifying the fact that we've been bad-mouthing them, treating them like garbage, talking behind their back, gossiping against them, cursing them, calling them names for all these years. Today, God says, that's it. Enough. Done. And you will be held accountable for it, church. Let me tell you. I will be held accountable for it because we are no longer ignorant. We are no longer self-righteous. For there is none righteous, not even one. For all, say all, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Hallelujah. So God is calling us to offer grace and unconditional love. My prayer is that when people come in contact with the people in our church, they meet Christians who choose compassion instead of condemnation. That we are examples of Jesus, the real Jesus, not the made-up Jesus that some of us made up. The real, loving Jesus. The Jesus who does not let our sins define us, but provides a path out of them, a path to freedom. Hallelujah. Guys, if we do that, if we do that, that Jesus that we're talking about, the real Jesus will be irresistible, irresistible to those that we love, to those that we show compassion to, to those that we choose to offer grace to. And they'll give their lives to him. And he will change them, not us. He will change them. This will happen if we love like he does, church. This will happen. Amen? 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 Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance to you, and give you peace this day and forevermore. And all God's compassionate people said, Amen. Have a memorial day, guys. Have a great weekend.